Yo, uh, yo, what's going on, people? It's Mugsy, I'm kind of hip hop ass from Sydney, Australia, up the land down under. And right now, I'm gonna do this kind of, you know, interview about myself. Quick little video introduction for AMA hip hop. Five elements, knowledge is key, and it don't stop. So, um, let's have some fun with this, and hopefully, it shares some insight and sparks some knowledge for whoever wants to start their career. But hopefully, it just gives some in depth and intake on, you know, hip hop artists such as myself here from the land down under. And yeah, I'm gonna have some fun with it. So, here we go. So, let's rewind for a sec. Let's go back to my origin roots of the past and. I started dabbling with the culture of hip hop and getting into, you know, the house of it around the age of 14. So roughly the early thousands kind of era when we used to have dudes like, you know, Slim Shady, Eminem, um, G Unit, Jay-Z and, you know, the whole Rockefeller, the Diplomats, uh, man, Chameleon and Paul War, you know, like that, that whole era of like hip hop and Man, I remember being 14 and before any of this happened, before I dabbled and associated myself with the culture of hip hop or even appreciated its art form, I was kind of a, I guess you could say outsider kid, a bit of an outcast, you know, I was very alone, um, but you know, I tried to find people to relate to, you know, in, in a sense, at that young age of 14, which kind of escalated me into the wrong crowd of people, you know, and being with those wrong crowds of people, whether it be, you know, just wilding out or, um, you know, I wouldn't want to say get, get into the, the sort of drug infused and all that kind of jazz, but, you know, that kind of crowd sort of tricked my mindset into having a mental strain of depression and anxiety and just doubting myself and even hating myself to the point of rock bottom all the time and just getting, you know, isolated by the world of society, you know, whether it be punked and bullied or um, just not feeling like I'm a part of something, you know? So, I mean, I was suffering, suffering from a lot of mental strain and depression, but I remember the early thousands era of hip hop of labeling those guys, which I've marked down my influences. It was like this raw passion and aggression of expressing yourself through rhythm and poetry and expressing your message to the world, whatever you could do, you know, in the art form and not just say it verbally to, you know, like I'm saying now, it'd be like you could use bars, rhyme, poetry, attitude, aggression, um, in the wordplay of music, just to get your point and expressions across. And I love dudes, you know, like, you know, Eminem, of course, being a white boy myself, but just this art form of attitude, which was quote unquote hip hop, you know? And, um, yeah, man, I mean, like, it was just like a form of expression in a sense. And, it, like, it just captured me, you know, uh, I didn't want to be that sort of shy kid, outsider kid anymore, I wanted to really dabble into what this culture was about, and I remember in the early thousands, man, coming home from school, we would have shows like, you know, MTV, BET, VH1, um, 106 and Park, and it was just non-stop flooding hip-hop and the culture of hip-hop, you know, and I always say that the thousands was such a great era of its pinnacle of its marketing strategy, you know? And at first, I thought, you know, 8 Mile just dropped in. Like, I'm gonna put a front line on this. Every white boy wanted to be a rapper when that movie came out. Like, whoever's white, like a white boy watching this, every white boy from the suburbs really wanted to be a rapper. Like, do the whole battle rap thing. And I guess you can say, Malibu's most wanted be rad star, but with me, I never wanted to get into the battle rapping star, even though, you know, a lot did, I still went down the Eminem path, and my first ever dabbling with rhymes, I remember really mimicking exactly what M used to write, like, like, you know, his Slim Shady and Marshall Mathers LP style, which was that real, 
you know, villainy, psychotic kind of way of writing, you know, and at first it, it was real therapeutic to get out, get out my aggression and my anger, but over the course of, you know, time, and I start to really see what, what this culture could do, where it wasn't just the early thousands, or I remember, you know, when I would listen to the art form, or listen to, or watch, you know, the TV shows, and um, just see artists that I would look up to would talk about real OG kind of pioneer guys from, you know, the 90s, the 80s, the 70s. Like, I realized there was much more of a culture out there than just my circle, like my bubble and my era. So, I mean, I wanted to learn where that, that came from, you know. I wanted to learn about the 90s, like the, the raw and gritty, like, lyricism era with dudes like Nas, DMX, you know, Tupac, Biggie, you know, Big L, Wu-Tang Clan, man, I could go down the list to, you know, the 80s, which was like, you know, Rakim, Run DMC, LL Cool J, oh man, you know, M MC Search and Pete Nice, and to, actually, that's a knowledge tip, to anyone that's watching this, Eminem wasn't the first white rapper, to anyone that wants to learn a bit more about the hip-hop culture, check out MC Search, Pete Nice, the third bass crew, you know, like, Songs like The Gas Face and, you know, Pop the Weasel and stuff. MC Search was the first ever white rapper to come onto the scene of the House of Hip Hop, so check that out. And he was the one to also not locate Scout. That's the word I'm trying to think of. He was the first one to scout Nas and spark the whole Illmatic kind of, you know, kind of vibe. So MC Search, go check him out. And he's got incredible stories about everyone's heard, you know, the MC... Hammer One and, you know, obviously the Ghetto Boys with Bushwick Bill and Scarface and all that. But, um, yeah, so obviously the 80s and then obviously the 70s, which was, you know, the pinnacle and the origins of the evolution of hip-hop, you know, which was the birthplace. I mean, you know, 1520, Sedwick Avenue, South Bronx, New York, you know, the Boogie Down Bronx with dudes like, you know, Grandmaster Kaz, Oh man, you know, DJ Cool Herc and African Bambada. And man, I remember just being so attracted to the roots and the origins of it, you know, like when it was a form of, you know, DJing and, you know, graffiti and man, like whoever could like rep the mic, you know, hey, hey, yes, yo, it's yes, you know, like just to get those block parties going. And it was just so and thrilling in a way, and eh? just yeah, a young 14 year old kid just being so wide eyed open and, and thinking, man, like there was more of a culture out there than just my 2000s era, you know? And over the evolution of time, which was like you had disco in the 70s, and then when like, you know, Run DMC came with the Adidas and, you know, the leather jackets on and, and like the big rope chains, that's where like sort of hip hop really. I guess evolved into its true art form of what it, I guess you can say what it wanted to look like and then you had obviously LL Cool J for the ladies and it's funny man because even though we're in 2019 still to this day man I think I'm gonna go into a whole different level here but Rakim is my number one MC and a lot of people say to me yo mostly I thought Eminem would be but Personally, man, I think Rakim is the, the number one MC. And to any hip-hop heads, if you don't have Rakim, any of his songs, I'm not talking about Paid and Full and Microphone Fiend. I'm talking about if you don't, like, because they're, you know, he's obviously ones that he's known for, but if you don't have a whole bunch of his catalog in, you know, whatever, your iPod, your iPhone, your playlist, or your Walkman, whatever, then go check him out, man, or even know about him, because Rakim, like they say, he is the God MC. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, let's rewind for a sec. I remember really mimicking what M did, but, you know, really, over time, learning about the culture, I would see the pioneer guys, like KRS-One, or, you know, Grandmaster Kaz, or... You know, just like the, those real OG kind of guys that really have the form of expression of hip-hop. And in their interviews, they would say, you know, hip-hop is brought, brought up on authenticity and having a uniqueness about whoever, whatever person is getting into, into the house of it. Like, you can have your influences, but 
if you're really mimicking your idols or your influences and not showing your true self in the in the art form of hip hop, then you're really going to be frowned upon as an MC. Like you know, you're going to be clowned on in, in a sense because it's like it's like yo, Mugsy, we already have an Eminem. We don't need another one. You know, like what is your calling card in this? So it, it really a light bulb really went off in my head, man, to be like, all right, drop the whole. Eminem, kind of slim, shady, Australian, you know, Crocodile Dundee act, I guess you can say, and find your true calling card. What do you want to express to the world in your, I guess, your, your, you know, your, your house of hip hop. And I just really wrote about, you know, my depression and, you know, my anxiety and how I viewed, like, people around me and how I viewed the world and stuff. And I guess in a sense... It was more storytelling than, you know, aggression. Uh, but, you know, so, I mean, that kind of carved into, you know, my sound of just having a vocal message of giving back to whoever's listening to it. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, yeah, like, I guess you can say that that's my origins in a, in a sense. But from 14 to I'm 28 now, man, it was kind of funny, like, as a young age, having those goals and those influences, I remember, you know, one, I could be a notebook rapper and just write it in my notebook, or two, I had the epiphany hit my head off thinking, I need to have material, because if you don't have material, then who's going to know if you're an MC or not? Who, who's even going to know about your craft, you know? It doesn't matter if it's a high top, high notch album, if it's just a rough demo and it's still, you know, out there to like hustle out there, maybe like hand out a gigs or even just hand out to your friends, people will know you're trying to do something. So at a young age, I remember, you know, I think I had like roughly three tracks yeah, on like my rough demo, like my first ever rough demo. And even to this day, when I listen to it, it's the most scrappiest, crummiest piece of work. Like sometimes my boys put it on, you know, all like, you know, my friend, my friends, like my homies put it on just to take the piss out of me, man. And it, it, like I have to walk out of the room. Like even if I've had a few drinks and stuff, I have to walk out of the room because like... Sometimes I like to laugh at myself, but that thing, man, is so damn grummy, man. It's just, it sends, my, my blood runs cold with it. But rewind back to the, you know, that young little adolescence teen of me, you know, it was just, I needed material and get it out there as much as possible. This was before Instagram, my, you know, Facebook. This was MySpace, MSN days. Remember, you know, MySpace and MSN? Or when you wanted to download something, it was like LimeWire and I think it was BearShare and stuff. And it would like, you know, get heaps of viruses on your computer and everything. Yeah, that's what, that was those days, you know. And um, I, I remember making this like, you know, this three track demo and just hustling it out there as much as possible. Whether it be, you know, the local radio stations or, you know, the like local youth centers or even around my, my school and stuff just to get my, you know, my name out there as much as possible. And over the course of time with, with doing that, the problem I had was there, there was a lot of ego and, um, added, no, I wouldn't say attitude. It was a lot of ego and, um, you know, bitterness with the house of hip hop over here in Australia. Like, I mean, dudes would be in their own kind of groups and ways. Like, it'd be like, yo, like, you know, Mugsy, I'm an upcoming artist and stuff. Check out my material. And they'd be like, Mugsy, we've never heard of you before. Like, you know, like our crew's never heard of you. Or, you know, um, this hip hop group over here or this hip hop crowd hasn't heard of you before. So prove to us that, you know, you can showcase your skills and stuff. And if you would showcase your skills, Sometimes it wouldn't even be good enough onto their level and stuff. And there was this very, um, like, not openness to, you know, want to collab or even want to connect, uh, you know, and bring, like, both of our, I guess, knowledge and careers together. You know, it would be very, 
um, not spread out, like separated, like, you know, in, in the Australian hip hop. And, or I'd like reach out to like a hip hop gig or a hip hop station and be like, you know, can you play my, my stuff or, you know, can you get me on this open mic night? And they'll just be just like, nah, we're more used to signing up the guys that we already know. And that, you know, having very little avenues over here, that's the downfall of even wanting to do this as a career. Like that is, I guess, the death of most artists because they're like, well, where's the avenues, you know? Like I'm trying to reach out to as many people as possible and they're not really, you know, taking the time to listen to me when I'm trying to reach out to them. So should I just give it up? And then I had another epiphany of one, I've got social media, which was obviously my space. Why don't I try and do the same thing that I'm doing here in Australia, but try and reach out to the States, try and reach out to the origin roots of where, you know, because it's quote unquote an Americanized culture of music. Why don't I try and reach out to the stations over there or the magazines or even just like the upcoming artists, even though, you know, my demo's crappy, you know, like scrappy crappy. Um, obviously my own country's not listening to it. Why don't I try a different country? So I did the same routine, how Mosey, blah, blah, blah. And next minute, inbox. Yeah, we'll put you on at this time on this station, inbox. Yeah, man, I'm an upcoming artist too. You know, I don't have the funds to raise my demo and stuff, but I'm still trying like you are. Check me out, vice versa. You know, magazine. Um, you know, we'll, we'll do this little feature or maybe one of your, you know, your rough demo tracks or something. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I realized that the States was so open and networking to as many, you know, avenues as possible. It's because they just wanted to get on any opportunity possible because we all have a dream to make it. It wasn't this ego and this attitude of like, you got to have the best quality album. You got to have, you know, this amount of people behind you. You got to have been the game for this long. It was just like, if you reach out to me, I'm willing to reach out, you know, get back to you. And that's what I loved uh, about you guys. And I mean, over the course of time, Australia has slowly been, you know, folding into that way of thinking, but there is still the old school kind of guys that really are secluded in their own bubble in a sense of like, you know, when a new kid kind of, come, kind of comes out, it's like, hey, you know, can, can I get on the open mic? And they're, they're just like, oh, we've never heard of you before. That's the problem I have with Australian hip hop, you know, with being so secluded in our own little groups and ways of thinking and not really coming together and just whatever's on the table, whatever's on the plate, take it and run with it because, you know, I don't want to bust my ass in a nine to five job and do music on the side like majority of us are doing over here. I'm willing to open up and give as many opportunities and networks as possible just so it branches out the Muggsy brand, the Muggsy name to get myself out there. And I feel like that's what a lot of Australian artists need to be need to be doing in their own careers, you know? Not have such an ego behind them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that's why I get tons of messages sometimes about Muggsy, I see you get on so many radio stations across the world or, you know, so many interviews in these magazines and these podcasts or, you know, the likes and the followers on your fan page, how are you doing that and being so from Australia, but I'm from a, you know, I'm from a small town, man. I'm not, a, you know, like I'm about two hours north of Sydney CBD, like the Opera House, the Harbour Bridge, you know, Luna Park, all that kind of stuff. I'm very country, man. And they're just like, yo, like you're, you're so secluded, like in this small town, how do you get so many opportunities meanwhile we're struggling to get gigs and stuff and it's like man the reason why I'm, I'm getting all of this opportunity and putting myself out there is because I don't have an ego about it you know like whether the person has 10 likes on their on their vlog you know and they're just starting out and they come across my page and they're like look you know I'm just starting up vlog but Muggsy can I give you this 10 you know, 10 answers, questions and answers, you know, interview, will you be willing to, you know, sign it out, sign it back to me and, you know, I'll be willing to post it up. Man, it doesn't even matter on the numbers if you're big, medium or small. If you're willing to reach out to me, 
I'm happy to do it for you, man, because you're branching out my name as much as I'm branching out yours, you know, and I feel like that makes more of a more prominent and um, successful artist in the long run compared to someone, you know, saying, oh, you need to have this, this, this and that for me to rock with you. You know, that, that that's corny to me, man, you know, because we all have a dream. We all have something to make it. And I feel like we all need to, to need to network. Yeah, man, I have like my dislikes and stuff. Like, of course, um, you know, the whole new trap and like mumble rap kind, kind of era. I don't really feel feel that because I was, I guess, in a sense, spoon fed with a lot of greats. You know, like I mentioned before, Rakim, I'll mention him again. Or, you know, Wu-Tang Clan, Nas, DMX, all that. I was spoon fed so much, you know, lyricism, talent, greatness and stuff that it's very hard for me to switch off and, and get into what the new kids are doing, you know. I've tried to give it a shot, it's not my, you know, it's not my cup of tea, but in saying that, man, I'm not gonna just obliterate their career and disrespect them regardless. Like, I've had kids reach out to me and they're like, hey man, check out my SoundCloud, and I give it a bit of a listen, it's that trappy kind of mumble rap style, and instead of being like, man, you know, get the, you know, get the fuck out of the culture and stuff, it's more like, man, this ain't my, this ain't my kind of era, this ain't my sort of field, but here's a radio station or here's a guy that's doing the same thing that I know, hit him up, he's got a better avenue for you. And they become really appreciative about that man because, you know, they thought, oh, you know, he's an old cat and stuff, you know, he, he'd probably like disrespect me if I'm doing something new. And honestly, man, uh, I don't discriminate, man, like, you know, it's just whatever you, because I was a 14 year old kid too, I was brought up on the whole M&M's and Jay-Z's and blah blah and the whole parental advisory gangster rap kind of thing um, so I mean I don't dis you know anyone, it's not my cup of tea but you know so I mean that's a long kind of origins in depth about me, my career um, the person I am, the upcoming MC I am um, Oh, and one more thing I want to mention is, to be honest, in speaking on the whole new era of rap and the whole, you know, mumble rap kind of thing, I feel like the only problem I have with it is there's a lot of kids that disrespect where the culture has come from, you know, whether it's, you know, like I always hear, hear this you know, you guys are old, we don't need to listen to where it's really come from, we're doing our own thing now. Yeah, it's cool you're doing your own thing, but I mean, you're really stomping on where the culture came from and the guys that really paved the way for you guys to do what you're doing now. Like, I mean, I know guys that are in garage bands, man, and they, they love dudes like, you know, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, the, the Beatles, man, Guns N' Roses, Kiss, all those sort of guys. And, they're, and they're, they're like, I want to be like that someday. I want to be like, you know, those legends and, you know, tour stadiums and tour around the world, you know. And they just pick up a guitar and start rocking out in their own garage band, maybe playing to five people, maybe playing to their family members. But when it comes to hip-hop, it's like, dude, like, check out the brilliance of what this culture has come, you know, come from. Like the Boogie Down Bronx, you know, the 80s, which was like, you know, like the boom bap and like... Man, like the raw grittiness, you know, the commercial elements and just over the course of time of what hip hop has come to, like, and it'll really appreciate, it will, it will appreciate you more of an MC than your own bubble. Because yeah, I was in my own bubble of like the, the thousands, which was, remember like, you know, the platinum jewelry, the baggy pants, you know, the fitted caps and stuff and like the do-rags and stuff. But then when I saw there was so much more of the culture it really made me more of a prominent and dominant MC and more of a knowledgeable MC because I had that you know those roots behind me in, in a sense you know and I, I wasn't taking it for granted like I mean it's like yeah I'm a white boy from the you know the suburbs doing hip-hop how cool is that nah I really love this culture to death man like you know, that, that's my number one dream, to just fly to New York one day and just breathe in the boogie down Bronx and stand in, like, you know, in front of that comp like that, that apartment block of 1520 Sedwick Avenue of South Bronx, man. It, like, you know, if I could ever just stand outside, maybe have a boombox or something and rap to, like, the locals or something, that 
would be a dream come true, man. That would be better than performing in front of stadiums, man, because knowing I'm expressing my art form and my story in that, you know, that block that where the, that all started, words couldn't even express. I can't even talk by thinking of it, man, you know, but to the new kids coming into the hip hop game, man, appreciate where it's come from, man, and appreciate who's come before you because I really think it will make you more of a respectable, knowledgeable MC compared to someone rapping just for, you know, the sake of rapping it in a sense. And man, I guess that's my little insight of my origins, where I've gone in my career and, you know, how I came up in the house of hip hop, man. So yeah, and dude, things I'm working on at the moment, um, man, I, I, I've done like quite a few things from 14 to 28, but man, the, like two things I'm working on at the moment in my career, one is a documentary with Sydney Film School here in New South Wales of Australia. You know, they randomly stumbled across my page and um, the Sydney Film Festivals were coming up and they, you know, a lot of people were doing short films, but they wanted to think outside the box from short films and do a documentary. So somehow they stumbled across my page and they, they seen how dedicated I was to this culture of hip hop. And they hit me up and said, yo, Mogsy, like, would love to do a documentary on your career. Um, would you be willing to come down and, you know, have a discussion with us, you know, map out what we want to do. And maybe we'll, we'll come up to the coast and interview your friends, your family, and tell how you go into the culture and all that kind of jazz. So they came up, they brought all the camera crews up and the lighting crew and stuff. And we shot up here for, it was about three or four days of shooting, you know, different people that know me and, you know, obviously my origin roots of what, I've, what I'm explaining to you guys. And they're still editing it up and, you know, hopefully I get a copy of that this year. But that, that was pretty big to me, man, because, I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm such a chilled out guy, man. Like, I, I work hard, but, you know, like I said before, I don't have an ego behind me. I'm so chilled. And when they came up with the camera crews and stuff, I was like, all right, um, you know, I'll sit on the couch and you guys interview me and stuff. Like a lot would be like, yo, I'm getting an interview. You know, I'm getting a documentary about me. You know, like I'm going to showcase this and blah, blah. But with me, man, I, I was like, all right, um, do you guys want a drink? You know, do, do you guys want a cup of coffee or something? How, how are we going to do this? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty chilled with what, what I get on. But um, so I've got the you know, a documentary coming up that's hopefully going to be given to me as a copy soon and hopefully submitted to the film festivals, which will be pretty dope. And obviously, man, my third album. Now, I haven't released anything since 2013, and I know it's been, what is it, five or six years? Five or six years? Ah, uh, no, yeah, five or six years since I've released anything, but from 2013 till now, I pretty much got into the acting world and I mean I've been doing acting for a while I guess you can call me the Australian Marky Mark in a sense but you know I love performing these different characters on camera you know for these short independent Australian films but nothing can beat the adrenaline high and just the love of blueprinting and concepting that album and that um you know, that art of your own work in the studio and even when it's done performing in front of crowds and them just being so amazed and um, enlightened by what you've written in the, the House of Hip Hop, you know. So, I mean, at the moment, I want to do a double disc. Um, so, I'm in the blueprint stages of finding the right beats and finding the right structure and concepts and stuff for this third album um, because... Obviously, you don't want it to sound like your previous work. As an artist, we all know that, you know, if it sounds like your previous work, then you haven't done a good job, you know. So, I'm very unique about what I find with my beats or find with my concept. Like, if someone chucks me a hip-hop beat, man, or even, you know, it's a beat drum and then a snare and stuff, it sounds, it's sounding so plain Jane to me, man. Um, that I can't ride with it, man. Like, I love getting inspiration from everything, whether it's, you know, rock and roll, jazz, man, even, like, even orchestras, man. I mean, there, there's this great producer 
called Yani that I've been listening to and just some of the live shows that he posts on YouTube, man, or even his page and he's got the orchestras, which is like the violins and, you know, the chords and stuff, man. It's just, or when he's like playing on the piano and the dude behind him's like doing the drums and stuff, man. And it's like this big 30 people orchestra. Some of the, the melody riffs, man, I listen to that and think, man, that would be, that would be a dope hip hop song to write a few bars to. I guess he can call me like the, you know, Australian Kanye West in a sense, man, which is like, you know, get different inspirations and sources from other elements and avenues of music, not just hip hop, man. So, um, I mean, yeah, that's telling a bit of insight about what I'm working on, the documentary and the third album, but hopefully those two things get released for 2019. And, um, man, just can you keep continuing what I'm doing, which is, you know, interviews like this for you guys, um, you know, radio, acting gigs, seeing my face around, um, and just, man, appreciating what hip hop has done for me and really changed my life for, you know, for the better. Because I always say, if I didn't come into the house of hip hop or even appreciate where it's come from or even give my self well being and self all to this, you know, this craft that I love so much, I don't even know if I'd be alive today or even here today of what I was fighting through in my adolescence, teenage years, you know what I'm saying? So I'm thankful for that. And sometimes I get a little bit teary about it because it's so, yes, it's so universal and it's so powerful, but at the, at the same time, it's so beautiful to me, you know? And I mean, like I'm from Sydney, Australia, man. And hopefully someday I can just fly, like I said, fly to New York and stand in South Bronx and see the rec room where the first ever you know, hip hop part, you know, hip hop block party was at where DJ Cool Herc was riffing on the tables and stuff, man. And man, just smell and sense that vibe of where it came from, you know, and um, just appreciate my love for it. But man, I, I'm not going to get glassy eyed with that, man. But um, I mean, thanks once again to, you know, AMA Hip Hop for hosting this interview with me. Um, even though we're probably across the globe and stuff, different times, different whatever. Um, but man, thanks once again for, you know, showcasing real talent, real hip hop, five element knowledge and, you know, giving me the chance to tell my story and hopefully it sparks some viewers, you know, that are watching this as well. But most importantly, check out AMA Hip Hop and, you know, support their movement because they're doing incredible opportunities, you know, and also check out my page at Mugzy, M-U-G-Z-Y, but to worldwide viewers, that's M-U-G-Z-Y, Z-Y, whatever, and support my movement as well, and it keeps you up to updates with things like this, but most importantly, keep supporting real hip-hop for 2019 and the future and other years to come. I'm out, guys. Peace!